Hi, I'm Daniel Sandula. I'll be talking about codolinization and simulation for PyWars robots. Hi, I'm Paul Deans and I'll be talking about implementing high-level robot control and behaviors. Let's begin. This is how it started. In our school club, Games Creators Club, we decided to do PyWars. Since this is not about the hardware, I skip how we get to the first rover, but it quickly multiplied to a second and a third, so students can do things in parallel. Our first problem was with school computers, lack of connectivity and uh, Wi-Fi access. We started like everyone else with SSH and Nano Editor, uh, SAPing files to Raspberry Pi and maintaining backup of Python files, but that wasn't convenient at all. And it occurred to me that uh, Python can execute program from a string. And that is how Pyrus, Python Rover operating system, has started. So it was uploaded using MQTT and started remotely. Uh, very quickly, it got the ability to run services, independent Python uh, programs uh, communicating using MQTT. Immediately after that, agents followed code to be run for each challenge separately. Then we added client code to run on PC using Pygame to control rover and display feedback. It was followed with need to log data for later analysis. And that was slow and would clog MQTT, so it was rewritten to use sockets. Then it was rewritten in Rust for the speed. In the meantime, client apps grew and even added mobile-like UI app for the latest rover. Since it was written in Pygame, we had to come up with our own widget factory, along with toolbar with connectivity icons and the battery status. Now you know where it is going. I only started doing PyWars in 2018, so I don't have a very long history yet. Uh, and I was always more interested in hardware, both the electronics and the mechanical parts because I, know, I knew very little about all that, so it was always more exciting. Um, and I first built a four-wheel rover, a bit like the Mars rovers, then for the next five wars, I tried to build a walker with some very complicated leg mechanism. Uh, and I was always experimenting with crazy ideas, something new every time. Uh, and that means that I always left software to the end, uh, and that somehow I never managed to properly finish anything and that all that software always ended up uh, being like a bit of a mess. It reminds me of my youth uh, when I was a teenager learning how to program. Uh, then I was told uh, hardware is easy, software is hard. Yeah, same here. I was always thinking, I know software, so how hard can it be to control a little robot? Um, and I had some big ideas in 2019 uh, about how to organize my software and how to do things properly this time. Uh, but of course, I ne could never finish it. Uh, and the program I used at the competition was actually called something like testcontrol2.py, which tells a lot about the state of things. Exactly. We concentrate all the hardware uh, and all the sundry tasks too, uh, rather than software. I've been a software engineer all my life and I thought it would be easy. And that's why we put this little talk together in order to draw attention to some uh, good practices and uh, how to organize the code for small robots. We are talking about small robots, but what do we mean by that? Uh, they are small in size, maybe a bit like this. Uh, that's kind of obvious, but it also means that size puts a limit on everything else, like power, computing resources or hardware, the number of sensors. Uh, and above all, it means that it's relatively simple, because everything is limited, when designing software, we don't really need to worry about solving problems for a very complex system. In terms of software environment, uh, we have a uh, Raspberry Pi, obviously, which could be the smallest one, uh, Pi Zero, for example, uh, because most things really, need, really shouldn't need more than that. And we decided to use Python. It's definitely not the only choice, and it's not necessarily the best one for everything or for everyone. Uh, but it's very popular and has great support for the Pi, and it's a large community, which means that it's very easy to find examples, solutions to problems, uh, very easy to start with, and all this is very important. Also in my part, where I talk about higher level control, I'm trying to do everything in a single process. It's not just because of limited resources, but also because uh, I want to keep everything simple and small with very little overhead. For me, software architecture simply means putting everything together. There's a lot of different things you need to do uh, for your robot. For example, process inputs from various sensors at different rates. Um, you have to control hardware, motors or other actuators. And you also have to do 
have to be able to do multiple things concurrently, uh, for example, driving around while rotating a sensor. Uh, you also need some sort of high level control, high level logic or planning, keeping track of everything. And you have some other tasks that uh, may not be obvious from the beginning, but additional things you need to do like logging or telemetry or monitoring battery voltage. Um, and the overall challenge here is to keep all of these different, very different things uh, all of this manageable in software somehow. Okay, let's start with the main loop. Consider box standard main loop. I'm sure that almost all of us started writing code similar to this one, but small changes can make code much better. If you move code to separate method like this and call it from the main loop, we haven't done anything to significantly change the logic except ability to invoke one iteration at a time. But that can be easily improved. We might want to invoke main loop code at regular intervals of time. For instance, here we invoke code around 20 times a second, actually sleeping for 0.05 seconds in between invocations of a one iteration method. But those are not regular intervals. If we quickly fix it to something like this, we'll get code that is executed exactly 20 times a second given, of course, that one iteration method doesn't execute for longer than uh, 0.05 seconds. Even if it occasionally takes longer, i.e. it slips, maybe due to non-real-time operating system or code genuinely requires more time, it will still stick to exactly 20 times a second. Normally, you might want to know when your loop is executed. Probably to be able to know how long ago you did previous measurements so you can do some calculations. For example, calculate travel distance. Of course, here you can optimize code so the time method is not called that often. But the main thing is current time parameter in one iteration method. Reason for it is that you can call this method in many different ways. Well, in a few different ways. If code is sensitive to being called in regular intervals because of calculations work far better, like for PID algorithm, then you can cheat and send time in it should have been, not what it is. Also, you can call this method from a thread or simulation, faking current time to suit what you're trying to do. Let's now concentrate to iteration method. One thing we really would like to avoid is a jumble of code, different bits doing completely different things having different purpose. Like this. Reading sensors at a low level, along with the calculation, control decisions, driving motors all mashed up together. That is why it is worth investing some time to refactor code into separate methods, even better, classes. So iteration method can not only look better, but to have some benefits. We are going to talk about it shortly. Something like this. Previous code was very generic. And what I wanted to show is that eventually you might want to make it more specific. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Now, for the same one iteration code, we can have autonomous challenge solved as well. For previous Pi Wars, we've done exactly that. We had the one implementation for distance sensor, an ultrasonic sensor which had been proven to be quite unreliable due to the fact that Raspbian is not real-time operating system, then swapped it to another implementation of infrared I2C sensor, uh, and then for another implementation for the same sensor, but much faster. But more importantly, with such approach, it's so easy to swap distance sensors code for simulation inputs, motor drivers for simulation adapters, and drive iteration method from simulation instead of the main loop. Next thing I would like to talk about is splitting calculations from the method that reads inputs. First, we have reading physical values the sensors are giving us. For instance, ultrasonic sensor is returning measurement of time it takes for ultrasound to reflect from an obstacle. Gyroscope is returning rate of change and not absolute position. With those, we can then calculate values to the right units we are interested in. For ultrasonic sensors, the resulting value should be in millimeters. For motor encoders, we might want to have result in degrees the wheel has moved. And then, if you really want to do some high-level calculation, we could do it in a separate code. For instance, rover speed given distance sensor readings or angle change of wheels. All of those should go in different methods or even classes. For instance, if you swap distance sensor for another 
high level calculation are still going to the state, stay the same. If you swap motor encoders for angular magnetic sensors like AS5600, we will still receive degree change for each wheel as it rotates, which might be useful more for maintaining rover speed. Another example for keep co keeping code modular is remote control. We have code that fetches events from the gamepad, followed by main controller that reads gamepad state and dispatches commands to the wheel coordinator, which decides which wheel should turn or not and in which direction, which in turn will drive motors in given direction and maybe maintain the speed of each wheel separately. That's what we have done for our rover too. On the picture, J controller is main controller that interprets current gamepad state. Drive service is the wheels controller as in previous example, and wheel service is driving each wheel separately. That way we were able to keep the same remote control and drive service for two different kind of rovers just by replacing wheel service. Daniel has shown how to work with the main loop, making a separate function for one iteration and how to avoid mixing low-level hardware-specific code with higher-level control. But for a moment, I'll jump back to that simple first version of the main loop you've seen before and focus on the three phases in it. Uh, and the bit in the middle, I'm just calling it the clever bit. As an example, uh, let's say we want to drive our robot based on some distance measure measurements. So in every moment, the output is always a direct reaction to inputs. There's no planning or remembering where we were before. Let's think about that clever bit now and let's have a look at a more interesting example. Let's say we try to implement wall following. Um, here is the description of the pledge algorithm from a book. Uh, so this is the kind of thing you would find if you do some research for, for an algorithm that you want to use for your robot. Uh, we don't need to understand exactly how it works now, uh, but the point is that this is how a nice kind of high level description uh, generally looks like. Uh, let's call this a behavior. If we analyze this a bit, uh, we'll see that at some point it looks at uh, inputs when it checks if there's a wall or a corner somewhere. And this information can come from some sort of distance sensors. And also, it produces commands or outputs when it decides how to move or where to turn. Okay, so we have inputs and outputs and uh, this wall following algorithm is definitely the the clever bit that we wanted to do in the middle. So let's let's see uh, how it looks if we try to implement this in, in Python. And let's compare this to the main loop we had before. Let's see how this all fits together. If we look at our inputs in wall following, uh, wall ahead, corner right, or wall right, we can imagine these are simple functions that are really just specialized versions of this get sensor data function that we had before. Uh, so they all look almost the same. But if we compare what's on the left and right, we'll see that we have a problem. On the right, our wall following code should be the clever bit, and we want it to fit in the middle of our main loop. But that's clearly impossible. Our algorithm, this behavior, is already doing everything in its own main loop. So reading inputs, dealing with sensors, is all now happening inside the clever bit, mixed with logic. It doesn't look like that neat sequence anymore. If we try to match the actions, we'll see a similar thing. They are all over the place. And it gets worse. For example, we have this action that says turn left. Sounds simple, right? But it isn't. It can't be a single action that's executed by some motor or other hardware. In reality, it's quite a complex thing. It really means turn 90 degrees left from your current position. And all that involves something like this. Apply correct power to the left and right motors to start turning, then wait until we reach 90 degrees. So while we are turning, we need to constantly read our sensors, maybe a compass, uh, to check our orientation. And once our orientation is close enough to 90 degrees, we stop the motors. So we can see that to complete our implementation, uh, we need to add another loop with more sensor readings and actions inside. And that we can also see that even something basic as turning is actually not that trivial in the real world. But maybe this isn't all bad. Maybe we don't need that single main loop after all. We've seen how to separate concerns to keep our code clean, and we know how we can start breaking down this wall following problem and implement the details like turning left as functions we can call. This is all fine, 
as long as wall following is the only thing we want to do. But we probably soon realize that we need quite a lot more. Maybe we want to log our sensor readings to debug later and also the outputs to see exactly how the robot was reacting to some input at each moment. Maybe we want some sort of live telemetry to send all the current inputs and outputs to somewhere where we can monitor it. It would be nice to add some kind of safety checks, for example, to monitor battery voltage and stop everything if power is too low. We could even add the check to avoid bumping into walls. Looking at sensors, we could uh, have a safety check that overrides the output from our behavior uh, if there is some sort of danger. Uh, also, it would be really nice if we could switch between behaviors on the fly. So we could avoid writing separate programs for each challenge and we could keep everything else the same. This is where we can see the benefit of keeping that main loop. All this would be very easy to add around our behavior before or after we run that one iteration. Well, this is very similar to what we have done for something over the rainbow challenge. We have very quickly realized that there are only six different ways to visit corners in the right order if you start from the red ball. Our behaviors were split into two sets. We will first scan the arena for position of all balls and then turn to the red ball. And then we will pick one of those six combinations of visiting corners in the right order and execute them in the sequence. In our version of code, we had a global variable which held behavior called algorithm, which was used in the main loop. Then in each behavior, when we reach the final condition, we would select next behavior depending on what is next in behavior sequence we have picked after scanning the arena. So one of our problems is that we want to do additional things while we are running our behavior. They kind of look like activities or tasks that are running concurrently. And of course, we have tools for this. We could use threads. This sounds like an obvious choice, uh, but threads are better for something that's truly asynchronous, running something that's more independent with occasional synchronization. For example, when you're dealing with the outside world or IO, uh, where you have, have to wait for something to happen or react to something. Uh, but in this case, I'm just trying to organize my high-level control code. I'm not doing IO directly, I just need to do multiple things, but I would very much like to keep it all synchronized all the time and execute everything at a given rate, one iteration at a time. And maybe this is the key. We don't want to run a bunch of tasks independently of each other. What we want is simply the ability to execute our behavior not as a single block, but one iteration at a time. And of course, we have a tool for that too, state machines. We can turn our wall following logic into a state machine. It would be something that can keep track of what's, do what's it doing at the moment, remembering its current state, and you could call it from the outside one step at a time. So every time it's called, it would look at its input, look for anything that triggers a change, execute some actions, then return. Uh, and then when it's called again, it can carry on from the same state it was in before. You can implement this with a class or a closure that has some internal state. State machines are great and they can really help you to describe your algorithm. But the actual implementation in code usually isn't as readable as a diagram. To turn our wall following into a state machine, we would need to significantly change the code to make it possible to call only one iteration from it. We would need to introduce some explicit states a lot of if-else statements. Maybe it's not a big deal, but this really bothered me, this feeling that we can't express our original algorithm in the most natural way. So are there any other tools we can use? I think it's time to reveal the secret. It's coroutines. What are these? The terminology is very confusing. Coroutines, generators, continuations. And they are especially confusing in Python. They were introduced gradually under different names and for different purposes. But coroutines are not a new concept at all, in fact they are quite old. They have some really interesting properties. A coroutine is equivalent to a state machine, and coroutines are used for cooperative multitasking. Ok, let's take one step back and look at briefly what generator functions are in Python. So let's imagine generating a series of outputs or commands. Ok, this still doesn't look terribly useful. Let's try to fit it into our main loop anyway. Great, we can produce outputs with the generator now, but how is this useful? It just blindly spits out a series of values and we even commented out the clever bit. 
but generators have one more feature. They can also take inputs from the outside. So at the same time we ask for the next value, we can also give the generator some input. Suddenly, this seems much more interesting. Our generator fits right in the middle. Again, generator is a terrible name. It really hides the potential. Let's make our generator a bit more interesting and see how it can use its input. If you haven't used this before, the syntax with yield might look strange. Uh, it takes some time to get used to it. So let's go through the generator function. First, it takes an input using yield. Let's say this input is a map with all our sensor data or some other data structure. Uh, then it starts an infinite loop. Depending on some inputs, it decides where to go. And at the end of each iteration, it returns the output with yield. And at the same time, it also gets a new input value for the next iteration. Now let's look at our main loop. First, we initialize the generator by calling our function and then calling send with none. Then in each iteration, we call send again, but now with our current input, and it returns the output for us. So we can think about our behavior as something that generates a series of outputs, but it's much more than that. Another way to think about it is that it's a function that can, can be run in steps. When it's called again, it remembers its local state and continues where it left off, but with the new inputs. Let's call this a coroutine instead of a generator, because that's what it really is. And now we can maybe imagine how co coroutines can be really the same as state machines. And of course, they are used extensively for asynchronous I.O. in Python, but that's a use case that's not obviously similar to what we need here. And another good thing about them is that they are cheap. Switching between generators is much, much faster than the context switching between threads, and they are even faster than using classes with methods. We can now easily convert our wall follower code into a coroutine and call it from the main loop. But we are not quite done yet. We saw earlier that some of the actions in our wall follower code are actually complex things. For example, turn left and turn right. What can we do about these now? It's easy. These will become coroutines too. Coroutines can call other coroutines and they behave the same way as the main one. The special syntax is yield from. We can think about this as the equivalent of a function call, but between coroutines. We can also take this further. Earlier, Daniel was talking about how to solve a complex challenge by breaking it down into smaller behaviors and how you can combine them and switch between them. So taking his example, we can do the same with coroutines. We also talked about running other tasks before and after each iteration in our main behavior. We can generalize this by simply making every task a behavior and simply stepping through all of them in the main loop. When I was thinking about this, I took one more step, which may be a bit controversial. I decided to represent the whole state of the robot in a single variable. This can be any data structure, but essentially it's uh, just a bag of values, so we are using a dictionary now to keep it as simple as possible. So we start with the inputs that are coming from our sensors, distances and the compass heading. But I'm not only using this for inputs. Uh, I also store here the output from a behavior. In this example, set speed and set heading can be, can be the result of a behavior that set these as goals to go uh, with this speed and this direction, uh, and here it's turning uh, left in place. The state can also contain derived or calculated values. So let's say we have another task that looks at the goals, set speed and set heading, and calculates the motor power for the left and right wheels. This is of course a simplified example, but the idea here is that all this is still just control logic and nothing hardware specific. These motor power values can be percentages uh, and we still need some low level code somewhere that actually deals with a, a motor driver, hardware or GPIO. What's interesting here is that the output of a behavior uh, can be the input uh, for another. Also, uh, this state describes pretty much the current state of everything we know. This is great for logging and telemetry. You can examine the history of this, see what input correlates to what calculated values or outputs at any given time. And if we have a list of behaviors, they can all look at the complete state of the robot, use whatever values they are interested in, and add their own results. 
Let's say we have this very simple behavior that just wants to go straight. So in every iteration, it just outputs the same values. Then we have the next behavior in the list. This one looks at the goals currently set in the state and maybe also the compass reading and somehow calculates motor power. These two behaviors are independent but kind of cooperating to di drive the robot. Then we can also have a third one. Uh, this one deals with manual remote control, a joystick or a gamepad. Normally this behavior is silent. Unless we use the joystick, it just returns an empty value. But it allows us to take over control. It can translate joystick movements directly to motor power values. So we can have another running behavior before, before this, like go straight or wall following even. But this one says, I don't care what the previous one did, I just uh, want to take over, I have higher priority. So we could also have a pause button and when you press it, it will simply stop the motors. This doesn't actually stop the other behavior that's still trying to control the robot, it just blocks its output. So behaviors can be cooperating or even competing with each other. There is a lot more we can do, of course. I hope this shows how you can come up with clever ways of implementing behaviors, combining them and building something smart from simple building blocks. Time to move on to our next topic, simulation. So why would we want to simulate our rover? Here are a couple of reasons. Having PyVoice courses, especially for those autonomous challenges at home or build them at school or club, is not a simple task. Building courses require space and materials are not always cheap. And all of this requires some skills. Coding for over is not a simple task either. Certainly, there is some effort needed for coding cycle. We can't easily pause the real world, inspect variables and step forward afterwards. Let's quickly go to what coding cycle normally looks like. First, we write some code. Then, we send it to our rover somehow, maybe using SSH or SCP or when we're coding it on rover. Then, reset rover's position to the beginning of the course by physically moving it over there. Well, then start it and then we observe results, including failures, like hitting the wall, for instance. Then we need to understand what went wrong. After that, we need to change our code to potentially fix the problem or try out different solutions. And then we repeat all of it. All of this can be quite tedious and time consuming. As I said before, it is really hard to stop the rover at the right time in order to see what went wrong, to debug it to see the state of the program and inspect variables. So, what are the prerequisites to be able to run rover's code in a simulation? In order to easily simulate your rover, code needs to be ready for simulation. We have already talked about it earlier. That is why we moved code around to be able to swap reading sensors for inputs from simulation and swap motor driver module with outputs to the simulation. It is not always important to simulate fine-grained physics. Sometimes it is enough to just simulate moving of the rover. We can do it by swapping wheel coordinator or drive controller, the module that receives commands like forward and left and such, with simulated module. Let's talk about important aspects of simulation, what we really want to simulate. First obvious thing is to simulate how rover moves in the simulated world. And the second thing are inputs we would normally read from sensors. There are a few things to consider when simulating how rover moves. For physics realistic simulation, we might want to take in consideration mass of our rover and how powerful motors are, and then calculate the details, or let something else calculate the details, like physics frameworks. All of it would lead to a delay between rover's initiated action and resulting action in simulated world. We could even implement that delay ourselves if we want to simplify the simulation. The real world is not sterile and completely predictable. We can't expect rover to go forward in a very precise straight line. For instance, Motors are not exactly the same, there are slight differences in the magnets put in them. The wheels do not have exactly the same diameter. 
The terrain is not exactly the same under each wheel. And who knows what other effects we can observe in the real world. As a result, the rover won't always go in a straight line on its own. There are a few things we can take in consideration for distance sensors too. We can use geometry and analytical geometry to calculate distance between rover and the objects in a simulated world. Or we can use a cone in the simulated world and let framework calculate overlapping between the cone and the objects and then calculate distances between overlapping objects. Another important thing to take in consideration is how to simulate distance sensors given the fact that rover is moving. In our case, we can for argument's sake say that distance is equal to time if you assume that in this particular moment a rover is moving at a constant speed. If, for instance, the rover is moving 1 meter a second and we are running main loop at 20 times a second, then the rover will move 5 centimeters each loop iteration and that's the for rover that is not moving way too quickly. Just remember that straightish line test speed challenge a couple of years ago was 7 meters long. And it would take rover 7 seconds in this case, and 7 seconds is a long time. Faster rovers lead below 3 seconds. And that would increase distance it moves in a such scenario by 2.5 times to 12 centimeters. Back to our problem. We've got a moving rover where we can use distance to depict time. Point A was when last main loop iteration was finished and we started reading our distance using sensor. Point B is when next processing starts and we'll have our distance measured somewhere between these two points. Like here, D start is a moment when we start measuring distance and D end is when we finish. We really don't need to worry about the difference between times where we finish previous loop and when we start a measurement. We are mostly interested in what's happening between the start and the end. So, as I said, our result is somewhere between these two points. Now it's for simulation to return something which is closer to real world rather than just precise distance at the time of reading of virtual sensor. For instance, like this. We have a particular distance at that point, plus some noise as prescribed by data sheet for the distance sensor, plus some offset which can be positive or negative depending if rover was approaching the object or going away from it, and angle it was closing to. I know it's lots of mathematics, but it can still be fun. For 9 degrees of freedom sensors, or 6 or 3, depending which sensor you have or you want to use, we should bear in mind that Accelerometers are generally very noisy. There's lots of noise and they never return exactly to the middle where you would read no acceleration. Gyroscopes have far less noise, but they have a bad tendency to creep over time as temperature changes, for instance, and that's why many implementations use a gyroscope and accelerometer to compensate for that fact. Compass is really slow to settle to the right value and would still produce quite a lot of noise over a correct set point. And that's without any interference for other devices that could produce magnetic fields, like motors or mains cables. Motor encoders are opposite from other electronics. They are not noisy at all. They are very precise given you can read them in real time. Again, Raspbian is not a real-time operating system. But wheels do slip, and even though you get correct reading what the wheel did, this is not exactly what the rover really travelled in the real world. Let's now talk about camera input, and that is one of the main reasons I've created a simulator. Actually, it started as one of our Pi board distractions. First was virtual Pi noon, and then I've added some more challenges, and now we have virtual Pi wars. Camera input is hardest to simulate. You can always start with feeding stills from a video taken from rover going through the course and comparing if rover's actions are correct for the supplied video. Or create a 3D world, which is exactly the route I've started from. And don't forget that real video is not as clean as precise as one would expect. 
One of the reasons I deliberately left all the artifacts one would normally polish out of uh, 3D graphics like low resolution shadows, pixelation and stitching issues. And do play with ambient and directional lighting in your visual world. Real world will have plenty of those. But there are a few positive sides of creating your own virtual 3D world. We can easily fine tune number of frames per virtual second. Any picture, no matter where obtained from, can be used in OpenCV in your rover's code. It is easy to simulate a stereo pie and experiment with detecting distance. And also, it is perfect reproducible way of running machine learning at speeds your computer allows. But those are not only sensors. Microphones and audio do have their quirks and others their own. Do stop and think what they are. And don't forget, real world is messy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I first tried to use ultrasonic distance sensors and very quickly found that they can have a lot of noise and sometimes even completely wrong readings for corners. And I later switched to uh, different sensors and I tried to solve the maze challenge with a very simple algorithm. I spent a lot of time fine-tuning the parameters in simulation, playing with uh, adding delays or noise uh, to get a feel of the limits. And I didn't really do anything scientific, but it helped a lot. And maybe I was lucky, but at the end, the run in the real maze was almost exactly like my simulation. Exactly. So to recap, add noise to your simulated sensor inputs. Read specs of sensors you want to simulate. They usually show percentages of expected error margins and noise. Your robot movement in virtual world shouldn't be instantaneous. It can't just stop or change direction in an instant. Here are some ideas how to start with simulation of virtual world. First, is to decide if it is going to be 3D world. Or we can just do with a 2D world, which is more than enough for Pi Wars as most of autonomous challenges are done on the floor of an arena. Then we should decide if it is side view, as Pal did, or more conventionally, a top view. And if we need to doing something in a third dimension, we can always cheat, practically simulate to an a half dimensional world. For instance, Feed the Fish, this year's challenge, all is very much rooted to the floor of the arena, except fired projectiles and the interaction with the world is really limited. They are going to hit the opening at the top of the fishbowl or not. Now we can select tools and frameworks to help us with the simulation. Bully 3D is for simulating physics in 3D world. There are plenty of tutorials and examples on the internet. Unfortunately, it didn't work for us as it couldn't be used inside of a browser. Box2D is very popular 2D physics simulation framework. Again, plenty of examples and tutorials. I've used that one for Virtual Pi Wars. PyMonk is very similar to Box2D and has nice uh, Python examples. That was used for our simulator's physics engine. Next is to visualize what is happening in the simulated world. It is good to have a nice feedback, a window where we can see what Rover is doing in the simulation. Both Box2D and PyMonk have their own ways of presenting objects. Nice thing with PyMonk is that it can use PyGame to display its own internal objects. One idea for 3D visualization is to use it as excuse to learn about computer 3D graphics. I certainly have. For our distractions, Virtual PyNoon and then Virtual PyWars, and in the end, the simulator, I've used LibGDX, especially because of WebGL backend along with being platform agnostic. But the most popular 3D games framework is Unity. There are so many commercial games made with it and there are so many amateur examples and tutorials around. It is C-sharp based, which is very similar to Java. But now in 2021, we have so many other game frameworks to choose from and some of them are explicitly targeting Python. Hopefully I have given you some ideas how to organize your code so you can simulate your rover, uh, why to simulate it and what to simulate it and how to simulate it really. I might have skipped some easy parts but also I have skipped many of hard parts. Uh, our simulator is over there and you can always go over there and look at what we've done and improve it. Make your own simulation even better. Finally, I want to mention some references and inspirations. David Beasley's talks about coroutines, concurrency in Python and lots of other things, uh, these are amazing talks, I highly recommend them. And a paper from some time ago about the subsumption architecture from Rodney Brooks, 
a very original and influential idea which gave me inspiration about how to represent and organize behaviors. And this is the end of our talk.